Um, thank you very much for coming. I'm Chris Fitzsimon with NC Policy Watch. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Rob Schofield in a second, introduce our panel and uh, sort of moderate the day. But I was just uh, on a, we're, we're here in the NCAE building, we're talking about education. I was just writing a column about education today and I looked up a few things and one I wanted to share with you, it's not exactly on point for vouchers, but I think it puts where we are in perspective. The Department of Agriculture is uh, advertising now for an administrative assistant one position uh, at the department. This, uh, it's on the state government website. Uh, the job does not require a college degree, just high school or high school equivalency. The hiring range for that job is 30 to 38,000 with an expected hiring range of the mid 30s. Uh, a starting salary for a teacher in North Carolina right now is $33,000 and they're bragging about trying to get that to 35. So if you wonder when you hear about how much we value teachers and what they do every day, I think that sort of puts it in perspective about where we are in North Carolina. I would argue that uh, we don't value them very much. Uh, and I think another way we don't value them is taking the money that could go to paid teachers and help public schools and send them to wholly unaccountable private and religious academies, uh, which is the topic uh, for today. Uh, and we're thrilled that you're all here. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Rob Schofield. Thanks for joining us, folks. Thanks to all who will be watching online uh, when this gets posted to our website uh, this week, later on. But uh, we appreciate you all coming out on such a uh, lovely day. It's any consolation, our colleague Sarah Ovasco, who's our investigative reporter at NC Policy Watch, has been helping her mom dig out from about three feet of snow up in Massachusetts the last couple of days. I think may not be getting home today as a result of it. So it could be worse. Um, as I was walking in, Barlow Herger was just saying, I don't know why I'm coming to this. It's going to be all bad news. And, Chris didn't really start us off with a real cheerful day. But I do think there's some good news today, mostly because we have, we will be reminded of what an outstanding team of people we have working for the cause on this issue in North Carolina. Uh, but as you all know, for the time being, school vouchers have come to North Carolina, thanks to the state's conservative political leadership, several million dollars in taxpayer money now flow to unaccountable private and religious schools throughout the state. Last summer, state superior court uh, Judge Robert Hobgood struck down the voucher plan as unconstitutional, saying, quote, the General Assembly fails the children of North Carolina when they are sent with public taxpayer money to private schools that have no legal obligation to teach them anything. Since that time, however, both of the state's higher courts have allowed the voucher program to proceed. And meanwhile, the case challenging its constitutionality has been fast-tracked for final argument, which will be a week from today. The lawyers from both sides will appear before the state Supreme Court to make their cases. Uh, today, we're lucky enough to have a panel, a wonderful panel, of three experts who are going to both help us know where things stand, remind us of some of the arguments that we all need to take with us as we go forth to discuss this issue with our friends and colleagues, and tell us, put, just put some more of a, a personal imprint on the story as well. We're going to begin, uh, we, and actually I should note that two of our three uh, speakers today are actually folks who I think are undefeated in runs for public office, so that's another good sign <laughs> here today. And, I, and we actually do have, I believe, the chair of the Wake County School Board. Where's Christine? Christine Kushner is with us today. Thank you very much for joining us. Natalie Byer. Oh, and, well, wait, where's Natalie? Okay, there's Natalie from Durham. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> well, we're going to begin today with the one uh, non-office holder on our panel. Uh, my friend and colleague at the North Carolina Justice Center, Christine Bischoff. Uh, Christine is an attorney with the Justice Center's Education and Law Project. She's been there since, actually it's almost three years now, right? Right. Amazing. Before that, uh, she previously worked with the United States Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. Before that, NAACP National Headquarters. She's, as I said, a, a, a crackerjack attorney. She also has a beautiful eight-month-old daughter named Maya, who I'm sure she'd be happy to show you photos of <laughs> after the event. Uh, after Christine, we'll hear from the person who I'm sure you all is most familiar to you all, because and we'll need very little introduction, former uh, state superintendent of public instruction, Mike, Dr. Mike Ward. We're thrilled that he could be with us today. Uh, as you know, uh, Dr. Ward has spent several decades in the service of public education. He's been a teacher, classroom teacher, a principal, a local superintendent. Uh, he's, a, he's a national leader on this, on this issue and has been for many years as the chair of a variety of boards and associations. Uh, he's been at the University of Southern Mississippi. He won, was the hero of Katrina, the Katrina Hero Award. <laughs> he's been recognized all over the country and is today uh, a consultant and advisor to education leaders all over the country. And we're, we're just delighted that he could be with us today. But Christine's going to kind of lay out where we are with this, with this case. Dr. Ward's going to talk about 
the whole, the broader issue of vouchers and, and the future of public education. And then batting cleanup is our, the one person who's a current elected leader, uh, Wake, County Commission, Wake County Commissioner, Jessica Holmes, newly elected in Wake County. Uh, Jessica actually leads a double life because, and, and, and as she described her schedule to me today for a typical day, I can vouch that that is it's more like a triple life. But she is, in addition to being a, an elected official in our uh, home capital county here, she is an attorney and advocate for public education right here in this building at the North Carolina Association of Educators. She's going to bat clean up today and put both a sort of a personal story as well as discuss the, sort of the substance of the issue for you. So let's begin with Christine. And after that, after we've heard from our speakers, we'll have time for uh, interaction with the audience. Let's begin with Christine Bischoff. Thanks so much, Robert. Come on up here to the mic. Oh, Probably best. Yeah. Let's see. So again, I'm Christine Bischoff, and I'm a litigation attorney at the North Carolina Justice Center. And so I'm going to do two things today. So as Rob mentioned, I'm going to recap the case and kind of let you know how we got here, and here being a week away from the arguments in front of the North Carolina Supreme Court, which I can't plug this enough, but, you know, if next week, Tuesday at 9.30 a.m., we hope you all will come. I think it'll be really interesting to see because you care about the issue, but I also think it'll be interesting just as a, as a citizen, this will be a good case, case if you're going to watch one North Carolina Supreme Court argument your, your whole life. I think this will be a good one um, because we have good arguments on both sides, good lawyers on both sides. So in terms of how we got here, so uh, last December, in December 2013, the, the North Carolina Justice Center and the NCAE filed a lawsuit challenging the voucher program, and we represent 25 taxpayer plaintiffs. So these are plaintiffs from across the state, Mike Ward being one of them, and our plaintiffs are a diverse group. So diverse geographically, we have plaintiffs in 10 counties across the state, from Asheville to, to Guilford to Fayetteville to Selma to Charlotte. Um, Diverse racially, we have African American plaintiffs, white plaintiffs, Hispanic plaintiffs. Um, Age-wise, we have young parents, we have grandparents, uh, we have teachers, we have elected officials, we have religious leaders. Um, and economically, we have middle class plaintiffs, we have upper class plaintiffs, and we have low income plaintiffs who, in, that, in fact, qualify for vouchers. So a diverse group, and you know, one thing they have in common is every, all of these plaintiffs fundamentally believe that the voucher program violates North Carolina Constitution. So we filed our lawsuit in December of 2013, and we're called the Hart case. Um, and our, our main plaintiff is Alice Hart out of Asheville. And so about a week later, the school boards, the, the North Carolina School Boards Association, and about 80-some local school boards filed a, what we call it a companion case, so a very similar case. They have one additional claim about religion, but Essentially, to this point, the cases have been heard together. And they're called the Richardson case. Um, the North Carolina Supreme Court is going to hear arguments separately. Ours is at 9.30, theirs is at 10.30. But the trial court treated them as one. So we filed in February, and then, uh, so that's our side. And then on the other side, we sued the state. So the state of North Carolina is represented by the state attorney general's office. And then two groups intervened, meaning they just, they joined the lawsuit on the other side in support of the state, so in support of vouchers. And those were two parents, so they're called the parent interveners, and they are parents who want their children to be able to use a voucher to go to private Christian schools. And they are represented by a group, a libertarian group in Northern Virginia called the um, Institute for Justice. And their deal is they just go around the country getting involved in these cases, supporting vouchers. So they've been in the Florida case, the Arizona case, the Colorado, they've been in them all, and now they're in North Carolina. And then the other interveners are the legislative leadership. So our <laughs> legislative leaders, um, and they've hired a law firm, Nelson Mullins, so they're paying, so basically our tax dollars are being used to, for the state to pay the Attorney General's office to defend the program, and for the state to pay this private law firm to defend the program. So, um, so those are the parties on the other side. So. Uh, in February, the trial court said, um, granted a preliminary injunction, and so what they basically said is, the program must halt um, until I hear a full uh, hearing on the full merits of the case. 
So that was great for us. So the program was going to halt in February, and they were going to have a hearing later. But then the state Supreme Court said, no, that's not going to be the case. We're going to let the program go forward until we have a full hearing on the case. So as you probably heard, all summer the program, you know, kids were applying, kids were receiving vouchers, the lottery was, you know, lottery winners were picked. And so then we had a full hearing in August, and we just could not have won bigger at the hearing. So basically the trial court judge said that he found the program unconstitutional on all of our claims. And um, the trial court judge, Rob said, read some of the language. The trial court judge said also that um, it appears to this court that the General Assembly is seeking to push at-risk students from low-income families into private schools in order to avoid the cost of providing them a sound basic education in public schools as mandated by the Leandro decision. Um, the, the, uh, the court also said the General Assembly fails the children of North Carolina when, they, when they're sent with public taxpayer money to private schools that have no legal obligation, is what Robert, to teach them anything. So really a strong, strong opinion. So, so then all of a sudden the program had to halt. Had, it was unconstitutional. Voucher had no more movement could occur. But then the um, Court of Appeals said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to let the program continue for the kids who already have vouchers. So schools already started. Kids have started using vouchers. We're not going to make these kids change schools in the middle, you know, at the beginning of the school year again. So those kids stay in the program for the year. So, um, and then what happened, so normally uh, when a case, you know, the, whoever, when the first time a case is appealed, it would go to the Court of Appeals. And then most likely whoever loses there would appeal it to the state Supreme Court. So, but what happened in this case was the state Supreme Court said on its own, we don't want the Court of Appeals to hear this decision, to, to hear the case. We're going to hear it directly to us. So it's going to come directly to us. It would most likely end up with us anyway, so we're just going to hear it directly. So, so they decided that in the fall. And so um, then in December, the, the intervener said, well, well, state Supreme Court, we want you to um, allow the voucher program to keep running while, until you issue a decision. So basically what that would mean was if the state Supreme Court took two years to issue a, de a decision, the program could run for those two years. And the state Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to allow that to happen, but we will allow the state to take the administrative steps necessary to get the program in place in case it moves forward next year. But no new voucher funds can be paid out until we make a decision. So that was, um, you know, I think we did not consider that a, a bad thing at all. Let, let them do their state administrative steps, but no new money can go out. So then at the end of December, the other side filed their briefs. And so they had each of their parties, the three parties, filed a brief. And then um, some two amicus groups filed a brief, one group of, of Christian schools, and then one group called the Pacific Legal Foundation. And, and they, they get in these cases across the country, too. It's kind of what they do. So then uh, last week, our briefs were due. And so we filed our brief. But we had, in the Hart case, had four amicus briefs. So one was um, on behalf of the North Carolina NAACP, <coughs> written by the UNC Center for Civil Rights, Mark Dorson, Jennifer Marsh, and hopefully they'll say, you know, tell us a little um, in the Q&A period about their brief and what they, uh, it was an excellent, excellent brief. And then we had a, a brief from a group called the Education Scholars, and this was Jane Weddick, Helen Ladd, and then other Duke and UNC and state professors saying vouchers aren't a good idea. And then we had the North Carolina ACLU filed a brief on our behalf, and then the National Education Association, so the NEA, filed a brief on our behalf. Um, and so now the state case is all teed up to be argued next week on Tuesday, 9.30 a.m. And the address for the North Carolina Supreme Court is 2 East Morgan Street. So it starts at 9.30, and just say get there early because it's probably going to be crowded. But it will be very interesting to see. So that's how we got here. And now let me just briefly tell you our two main arguments. And you know, these were our two main arguments at the trial court level. They haven't changed. This, this is where we stand, and we feel very, we feel very optimistic about these arguments. Um, the other thing I want to just say before I say that is, so, so Mike and Jessica are going to talk about the policy, um, policy issues involved in vouchers. 
And those are all very, very important, very important issues at play for our state and for our kids. But it's very important to think this, when you think this through, to separate the legal arguments and the policy arguments. Because regardless of how someone feels policy-wise, the North Carolina Constitution says what it says, and our courts have to follow the Constitution. That's, that's the highest law. So, so even if people don't like vouchers, you know, that's one thing for policy reasons, but the Constitution has to be followed. So our, our two constitutional arguments, um, the first one is, is based on Article 9, Section 6 of the North Carolina Constitution, and that just says, all money, stocks, bonds, and other property belonging to the state for purposes of public education, together with so much of the revenue of the state as may be set apart for that purpose, that purpose being public education, shall be faithfully appropriated and used exclusively for establishing and maintaining a uniform system of free public schools. So it shall be used exclusively for establishing and maintaining a uniform system of free public schools. So our argument is very basic here. I mean, we, we argue that exclusively means exclusively. And the framers of the, the drafters of the Constitution said, money for the purposes of public education to educate the public must be used exclusively to establish this uniform system of free public schools. So, you know, giving public money to unaccountable private schools directly contradicts this. So that's, that's, our, that's our, one of our arguments. And again, we feel the history of the Constitution supports it, the, the intent of the framers supports it, and the clear text of the Constitution supports that. So that, that's one of our main arguments. And then our other main argument is based on Article 5, Section 2 of the North Carolina Constitution. And that just says, the power of taxation shall be exercised in a just and equitable manner just an equitable manner for public purposes only. So basically, the state can tax us, but it can only use our tax dollars for public purposes. And we argue that giving public tax dollars to private schools that aren't accountable, and when I say don't accountable, Mike and Jessica will talk more about this, but they don't have to have certified teachers, they don't have to teach any certain curriculum, they don't have to give a certain standardized test, they can teach kids for an hour a day, they can discriminate <coughs> and not accept anybody who isn't their religion, uh, they don't have to do background checks on the teachers, a teacher cannot have a high school diploma and can still teach in a private school, and you're not even allowed to homeschool your kids unless you have a high, a high school diploma, but yet you can, can teach in a private school that takes this voucher money. So, you know, all these things, both in terms of there's no accountability, how could that possibly be a public purpose? And then the fact that the school can openly say, Christine, I do not accept your, I will not take your child into my school because you are not fill in the blank religion. And they can openly say that, and we're giving them our tax dollars. So how could that be a public purpose? And in, and in North Carolina, education has meaning because of Leandro. So the, the Constitution says kids, kids have a right to a sound basic education. And that has meaning. It means certified teachers and resources, and kids have to learn science and math and economics so they can be contributing citizens. And, and all of that just directly goes in the face of, of how could it be a public purpose? So on that note, I'll hand it over to Mike, but happy to discuss further and answer any questions that you may have. I'm really pleased to be here today, and I'm, I'm grateful for a chance to talk about this issue. Um, it's one that's uh, of particular importance to me personally, but frankly, what matters is it's of particular importance to the well-being of kids and to the well-being of our state. Uh, and so it's, a, it's good to be part of this dialogue. Uh, in 2004, I was finishing up my second term as state superintendent. I didn't seek a third term because my wife, Hope, was under consideration to become a United Methodist Bishop. And United Methodist Bishops don't get to start at home. Um, so if you become a United Methodist Bishop, you go somewhere else. We knew that if Hope became a bishop, we were going to have to leave North Carolina. Sure enough, she was elected bishop. That took us to the state of Mississippi, uh, where she served her first eight years as a United Methodist Bishop, and where I joined one of the world's smallest fraternities, Bishop's Husbands. <laughs> 
Um, so we were there for eight years. Uh, and while Methodist bishops can't start at home, it turns out they can return home. So in 2012, Hope was appointed uh, to North Carolina, to the eastern half of North Carolina, as the bishop for all points, uh, Gibsonville, eastward. Um, and so we returned in 2012. Now, when I left in 2004, North Carolina's public schools had moved, and, and please don't misunderstand, I'm not taking credit for this. I know who did the heavy lifting. But in 2004, we had, we had moved into a position uh, where we were out of the bottom of the nation's barrel, education, educationally speaking. We had moved into the middle of the pack performance-wise. Uh, we had moved into the middle of the pack in terms of resources we committed to schools. Uh, we were in the low 20s with respect to the rank of our, our, uh, our teacher salaries. Um, so while we weren't at the top of any indicator, we'd gotten better than just about any other state in the country, and we'd gotten better quicker than most other states. So we were on a, a very solid trajectory of improvement uh, in the year 2004. Hardworking teachers, administrators, bipartisan leadership in the General Assembly, a business community that was committed to public education, all those things helped make that possible. So we came back home in 2012, spirits high, and we found a very different circumstance in North Carolina. What did you do? What did you let happen? Eight years, and we, we found ourselves returning to a remarkably different North Carolina than the North Carolina we had known previously. Well, uh, we, we, we re-engaged uh, with the, the community and, uh, and, and, and uh, with the policy uh, issues that are, that are uh, uh, on the forefront, on the front burner here in North Carolina, and, and, uh, and got active uh, and got busy. Um, and I felt strongly enough about one particular piece of legislation that I joined a, a group of litigants, um, and we sued over the voucher bill that had passed in the 2013 General Assembly. Uh, now, it's not an easy thing to sue your home state. North Carolina has been awfully good to me. Um, I'm a first-time college graduate, a first-generation uh, college graduate. Um, I'm a product of public education. Um, I went to NC State University for all three degrees. I believe that there's a reason that, that lifeblood is state red. Um, <laughs> this is, this is a, a wonderful place to call home. And so to decide to sue my state was, was a really difficult decision. But I just think this is incredibly bad policy. I think it's an incredibly bad policy direction for the state. Uh, and so I joined the, uh, the group of litigants that, uh, that are in court over this issue. Uh, and I did so for three reasons. I tend to, to organize things that I want to say into three points. I think it's because I'm married to a Methodist preacher. <laughs> and if you watch, if you count, they'll preach you a three-point sermon every time. <laughs> and it's useful uh, to know how many points somebody's going to address with you in advance because if it's going badly and you're counting, at least you know how much you have left to endure. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you three thoughts about why I think this is really bad public policy. Uh, first of all, it's bad policy because it runs counter to the spirit of progressivism where education is concerned in North Carolina. Our citizens have a progressive perspective on public education. It's manifested throughout our history. Um, we haven't always gotten it right. There have been some terribly regressive moments uh, during the course of our journey with public education in North Carolina, but for the most part, we've had a pretty progressive spirit as a state and as a group of citizens about the issue of public education. It runs counter to citizens' beliefs about public education. In fact, if you poll the question of vouchers among citizens in North Carolina, you, you, you consistently get a negative reaction to the idea of using taxpayer dollars to underwrite private school tuition. And I think that happens for a couple of reasons. First of all, citizens just by and large don't want to see their hard-earned tax dollars underwrite the tuition for somebody else's child. 70% of our kids, 70% uh, of our citizens, 70% plus of our citizens don't have kids in school. And that number's dwindling all the time. 
Citizens don't want their hard-earned taxpayers underwriting private school tuition. So that, it, it runs counter to public uh, opinion in, in that regard. Citizens don't want public dollars funneled to unaccountable institutions. We believe as taxpayers in holding institutions that use public dollars accountable for the use of those dollars. I believe it was uh, uh, Stephanie Bass at a meeting one day about, uh, about the voucher suit who said that your dog kennel is more accountable uh, than private schools in North Carolina. Now, I want to be clear about something. This isn't a diatribe about non-public education. Uh, uh, parents have a perfect right to choose private education for their children. Uh, and there's some marvelous non-public schools in North Carolina. So the point here isn't to badmouth private schools. But it is important to acknowledge that private schools, as a body, are not accountable. They're not accountable for performance. They're not accountable for the personnel, uh, accountable for a number of indicators uh, about uh, human resources uh, to which uh, public schools are held. Um, and so citizens don't want their resources going to non-public uh, institutions that are not accountable for the use of those tax dollars. Citizens don't want their dollars used to underwrite secular education. Some do. I, I suspect you can find some citizens who think that's a, that's a good enough thing to do. But for the most part, I think our citizens think that the, um, the Establishment Clause of the U.S. Constitution works just fine, thank you. It's a social principle of the United Methodist Church that we support the Establishment Clause. And so citizens don't want their, um, don't, don't want public dollars to underwrite secular purposes. Uh, and so I think that's an important consideration when we think about that first point, that this runs counter to the spirit of what, what North Carolina citizens want to see happen with their tax dollars. I think that the surest sign that the proponents of this legislation understand that this runs counter to public wishes and public opinion is that they chose to name it something other than what it is. They chose not to call it a voucher. They chose to call it an opportunity scholarship uh, with the understanding that vouchers don't poll well and that it needed to be renamed if it was going to garner any kind of public support. My second reason for opposing vouchers, for those of you keeping count, that's number two. It runs counter to research. The numbers, the data just don't support enactment of a system of vouchers. If you look at the systems in the United States, states in which the Constitution isn't as, as uh, I, I believe, obvious on this question as ours is, if you look at states that have the longest running voucher programs, those states have produced data that shows that vouchers are not impacting either the general uh, state of public education and the general performance of, of uh, the student population, or for that matter, are they they prompt, uh, causing students who are the beneficiaries of the vouchers to, to surge ahead either. Vouchers are not impacting the performance of kids in the ways that proponents have suggested they might. So the research runs counter to the notion that vouchers will change the equation for the population in general or for the individual recipients in particular. Second piece of research that I think is important for us to remember, research demonstrates that public schools outperform private schools each time you, you uh, pose the question in a way that, that, uh, that equates for or accounts for socioeconomic variables. Public schools outperform private schools, uh, and that's clear in the research as well. So my second reason for opposing vouchers is that the research doesn't support the use of vouchers. I believe it's because we understand this research and I believe it's because we understand that kids who are truly disenfranchised, kids who are the most vulnerable in the system, are the kids who are least likely to fare well under a system of vouchers and tuition tax credits. And that's in spite of the rhetoric, and that's in spite of the language that says that this is a, this is a policy aimed at the most vulnerable kids. The fact is that the most vulnerable kids are not going to fare well under this system. 
uh, the vouchers um, are, 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 are aimed at a, a, a family income level such that it's not just poor and disenfranchised youngsters who are eligible for vouchers. Middle income folk are, uh, are, are eligible and, and the, the threshold, the income threshold will rise. So this is not policy that uh, I believe is, 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 as the language suggests, specifically aimed at poor and disenfranchised children. This is a public policy that's aimed at, at uh, making vouchers available ultimately to uh, kids of middle and upper income families. If you look at the voucher program in Milwaukee, for example, under their guidelines, over half the kids in Wisconsin would be eligible for vouchers. Income thresholds have gone up for vouchers in other places. Um, so I believe it's for these reasons. I believe this research and, and, and this, this, uh, th this line of reasoning suggests to us why those who advocate for children who are at a disadvantage in the system don't support vouchers and tuition tax credits. And they certainly uh, don't consider the proponents in the legislature of this policy to be their champions. The third reason, if you're keeping count, is one that's already been, I think, laid out for you um, uh, uh, very thoughtfully by Christine, and that's it's, it's unconstitutional. It's just that basic. It's just that fundamental. It flies in the face of very specific, very clear language in the North Carolina Constitution. So, for those reasons and others that I'd be glad to describe if, if uh, we want to get into them in the Q&A, um, I'm opposed to a system of vouchers um, and their, their cousin tuition tax credits. I want to close by thinking ahead a little bit. What if after next Tuesday, vouchers are determined to be constitutional? What if the Supreme Court of North Carolina says, this is okay? It's, it's hard to imagine that in light of our very clear constitutional language, but let's, let's anticipate the possibility for a moment that the court will rule in favor of North Carolina's voucher legislation. What ought we to do? The last thing I suggest that we ought to do is to just simply give up, to, to wash our hands of this particular policy issue, shrug our shoulders and say, let's move on. I think what we need to do next is create a political environment in North Carolina that makes it politically untenable to champion the release of any more public dollars to this program. That means political activism, that means hard work across the state to make sure that policymakers hear resoundingly that while it may, it, it, it may pass constitutional muster, it is not politically the right thing to do to continue to support such a policy. Now, that's on the off chance that the court doesn't see it our way. I, for one, believe that we're going to prevail on this issue, and I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your editorials when we get into the Q&A session. Christine was the only non-elected official on this panel. We can change that. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can have some conversations about that a little bit later on. But before I get into the policy, I think it's important to reiterate 
that Judge Hobgood agrees with us. He agrees with the plain language of our Constitution, which very clearly states, taxpayer dollars are to be used exclusively for establishing and maintaining a uniform system of free public schools. So yesterday I was at this meeting and this question was posed. You have a mother whose child attends a school that has been designated as an F, has been given an F grade. This mother is sort of stuck in this neighborhood, doesn't have the option to move. Neighbor down the street who's wealthier says, I'm going to take my child and move my child to a private school. Mother says, I pay my taxes. Why can't I use my tax dollars and send my child to a private school. My child attending this F school, this will impact their ability to get into college. I want my child to have a future just like the person down the street. What do you say to that mother? After pondering that question for a while, I had a question of my own. My question to that mother would be, did you vote in the last election? The North Carolina General Assembly is tasked with providing a sound, basic education for all of our kids. So the schools that received a D and F grade, if those schools are indeed failing, what that says to me is that our General Assembly is failing. Now, Some legislators like to take sort of a laissez-faire attitude to government. I'll give you an example. Former Representative Tom Tillis, big proponent of the voucher program, big proponent of diverting our taxpayer dollars to public schools. He is so keen on deregulation that he doesn't believe that the person cooking your dinner should wash their hands. That same rationale shall not be applied to our education, to us educating our kids. I say to that parent, do you really want to apply a no hand washing mentality or rationale to the education of our kids? These private schools aren't required to be accredited. They're not required to hire certified teachers. As Christine mentioned earlier, if you decide to homeschool your child, you have to at least have a high school degree. To teach a child at a private school, you don't even need a high school degree. Not to mention safety concerns, because only one person in the entire school is required to undergo a background check. On top of that, they're not even required to teach a curriculum. Now, no one's against private schools here. I certainly support parent choice. Parents have always been given a choice. They've always been given the option of sending their child to private school if they can afford such. But I say to you and to that parent, we will not allow a no hands washing mentality to be applied to our taxpayer dollars. Now, I'm going to take off my lawyer hat for a minute and speak to you as that low-income child that this legislation was proposed to, to benefit. So I was raised by my grandma. She had the smartest woman you'll ever meet with a fifth grade education. She has never had a driver's license. So as that low-income child, one, I wouldn't be able to participate in the voucher program because she had no transportation. Our public schools provide transportation for all kids to and from school. Two, another requirement of the program. In order to qualify for this program, you have to meet the federal requirements for free and reduced price lunch. Now, since the first year, that requirement has gone up, and now you have to meet 133% 
of the requirement for free and reduced price lunch. Reason number two, I wouldn't be able to participate in the voucher program. I was on free and reduced price lunch. So although you're required to meet those requirements, they're not required to provide you with a free or reduced price lunch. So one, I couldn't get myself there, as many low-income students would not be able to, to, for their parents to figure out how to get them there every day. Two, they'd also have to come up with additional funds so that they could eat. Our public schools provide a breakfast and lunch to our kids. Reason number three, voucher program provides $4,200. How many good private schools do you know that cost $4,200? Some of the best ones in the state that have actual proven results are up to $20,000 a year. Third reason I wouldn't be able to benefit from this program. Who was going to pay the tuition difference? Not my grandma who retired from a dry cleaner in Jacksonville, North Carolina. So for those three reasons, transportation, lack of transportation, lack of the provision of free and reduced price lunch, and the lack of the tuition difference for these schools would have prevented me from participating in the program. Many, I would dare say most, of our students would be in that same boat. Those same low-income students that this legislation was supposedly designed to, to protect, can't take advantage of the program. Now notice, it started out being the focus being low-income students, but the very next year, the requirement cracked up. And there's been a very clear intention of allowing that requirement to continue to trend up. I can foresee vouchers only being accessible to middle class, and again, no one's saying vouchers are bad. No one's saying, well, no one's saying private schools are bad. What we're saying is, on the constitutional level and the policy perspective, it's a bad idea. First, it's unconstitutional by the plain language of the Constitution. Two, it's a bad policy decision. Those low-income kids will not benefit from the voucher program. Another concern. So the idea is, well, it, it usually takes less than $4,200 to educate a child in the public school system. So what you're telling me is you want to educate the most disadvantaged student on the cheap. You want to get them out of the classroom on the cheap. The most disadvantaged and underprivileged kids, you're going to save money on educating them? Our taxpayer dollars are for the greater good. This is what happens when one kid in a classroom accepts a voucher and leaves. You have a classroom of 25 students. One kid leaves and goes to a private school using the voucher program. You have you know, 24 kids left. What happens is the funding for that child is no longer provided to that school system. But yet you have this classroom with 25 chairs. All that's left is one empty desk and 24 other students. There's still a light bill. There's still heating costs. That teacher has to still be there. So all you've done is you've taken this classroom that was filled with 25 students and you've taken money for them, away from them. You haven't solved anything because those 24 kids are still going to need the lights to be on. They're still going to need the same internet access. The building costs are not going to reduce, but yet you've reduced the amount of funding that this school has. I can't speak enough about what it is like being that low-income child in that school system. And I'm, I'm from Pender County. It's, it definitely did not receive an A, <laughs> my high school in particular. But what I tell you is this, when you start diverting funds away from an already underfunded school system, all you're hurting is the kids. And more importantly, 
It's impacting teacher morale. If it wasn't for Karen Quinn, my aerobics teacher who let me spend nights with her so that I could participate in extracurricular activities, if it wasn't for Rochelle Whiteside, my drama teacher who told me I had a voice. I used to be so shy and nervous, I used to sort of mumble when I, when I spoke to people because I just didn't, I almost didn't feel like I was worthy of having something to say. I was reading lines for a play one day. She said, Jessica, speak up. We can't hear you and you have something to say. Now, to my family's dismay, I've been talking ever since. <laughs> but when you start removing Karen Quinn from the classroom, when you start removing Rochelle Whiteside from the classroom, you take away my ability to exist. So rather than helping those same low-income students that you claim this voucher program is for, you end up hurting us. Now, I can talk to you all day with my attorney hat on. We win that argument too. I can talk to you as that low-income student, this legislation was designed to benefit, and we win there too. We ask that you join us on the 17th. We need your love, we need your vibes, we need your letters to the editor. But more importantly, just send us some love and send us some prayers because at the end of the day, I am most concerned about those 24 school, those 24 children left in that classroom without a choice. Those students that won't have the transportation, those students that can't afford the free and reduced price lunch, those kids whose parents can't afford the tuition difference, those kids like me are what I'm most concerned about. And those are the kids that our tax dollars promised to support. Thank you. That's great, Jessica. Thank you very much. Um, one, before we take questions, I do want to highlight one other person in the audience, and that is my colleague Lindsay Wagner over here, who many of you maybe read her education reports, and if you're not, she has sort of redefined education reporting in the state in the last couple of years, and we're you know, just so proud of her work at NC Policy Watch, so please do subscribe and check her out. We're going to take questions from the audience. Now, we don't have a microphone for y'all, so whoever's asking a question will really need to project. And, and with some trepidation, I'm gonna pass this microphone around. We'll see if we pull that off. But we are recording this for the internet, so we wanna try and catch everybody's voices as best as possible. So the first hand is there in the back, so please speak up. Yes, ma'am. Given what the Constitution says, how is it that the attorneys who support the vouchers, how do they interpret that? Christine, you wanna take a shot at what their argument is? The question. the question is, what are the, what's the other side's constitutional argument? How, it seemed, the language seems so plain. How do they respond? So, so that's, a, that's a great question. And so the other side, they are using, um, so when you go home and Google this, Google the North Carolina Constitution, look at this provision that I've, that I've read you, Article 9, Section 6. So it's law. Um, and there's a lot of, it talks about using swampland money for this purpose and grants and gifts. Um, and so they basically say that, that the language here do, does not preclude the legislature from using money for private education. That sure the public education dollars must be, um, must be faithfully appropriated to public education, but it doesn't preclude the dollars from being used for private education. And so our, our response is that that makes no sense. That of course dollars that are appropriated for public education must be used, I mean, that, that it, it basically is taking away uh, the, the meaning of that language that to, to say that twice. So, so that's our response. And there's also some interesting, and if anybody is interested in learning more about this, feel free to email me and I'll send you the brief which, which talks a lot about the constitutional history and the constitutional, you know, the North Carolina Constitution has been amended several times. And they, they also use an argument that um, at one point the Constitution said that, that this money shall be used for this purpose and no other purpose whatsoever. 
and because the current constitutional language doesn't say for no other purpose whatsoever, then, then the money can be used for private education. But our response is that it doesn't say for no other purpose whatsoever. What it says is exclusively. So the, the drafters of the Constitution just, um, yeah, this lessened the number of words that were used. So, Mike, want to add? I, I, I just want to add one thing to that, and that is that, that let's say that, um, that, that, that things proceed as we think and hope they will, and that, that vouchers are ruled unconstitutional um, by the state Supreme Court. Still be on the watch for legislative sleight of hand um, that seeks through some nuance of language to still worm some type of legislation of this sort. I mean, we, we've already heard some legislators say, uh, in the wake of some of the hearings that have taken place, we can fix that. We can fix that. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't get a chance to mention this early, but there's this um, committee that was um, created in response to the Brown v. Board of Education decision in 1954. So North Carolina's response to that, um, the requirement to integrate, was to create this committee. And basically what this committee did was create a voucher program. So North Carolina, there is a, a precedent for this. So what happened was North Carolina created this, um, this voucher program that basically said, you can use taxpayer dollars to send your child to private school if your child is assigned to a school that is integrated. What was decided in that case was that because of the plain language reading of the Constitution, they needed a constitutional amendment in order to enact this voucher program. And in a sense, it's the same issue here. Because the plain language of the Constitution is so clear, if they wanted to create a voucher program, they would need to amend the Constitution. So while that's not an argument in our briefs, that's some context to, to the fact that the first time North Carolina created a voucher program that was supposedly in the public interest, it was under the auspice of avoiding integration. And as you can see, that, that was not successful. We'll go Amy and then Jason. Um, this is on the same line. Um, now, didn't Paul Stan and some others try to say that our, the way that North Carolina subsidizes private universities allows for this? Can you explain how that came to be in the first place? The question why, is, why, why we, we, give private, we give public money to private universities. Isn't that, why is this different? Why is it <laughs> Um, we forgot to set some ground rules, uh, some ground rules. and one is that, that uh, if we respond to a question with something like, that's a very good question, but one that will take more time to answer than the circumstances will allow, it means we really don't know the answer. And that's a really good question. Uh, I, I think uh, part of the response has to do with the fact that we require K-12 kids to go to school. Uh, we have a mandatory system of uh, K-12 age students, that, that uh, we have a mandatory requirement that K-12 students attend school. Yeah, so um, I, think, I think part of the answer uh, lies in that regard. We're not, we're not a system that requires kids attend post-secondary education. But I think that's probably a sign that I need to hand it off to an attorney. <laughs> well, and the, the other thought is that the other thought is that, you know, Leandro applies to K through 12 students, and no one has a Leandro right to go to college. You know, you you have the opportunity to receive a, a K through 12 education under our state constitution, um, and then and then, so and then policy wise, you know, so their argument is, well, a lot of private schools like Wake Forest can get Pell grants, can get state money, um, but you know, those those private schools are they. There are checks on those schools. So one, legally we're talking about two very different types of education, K through 12 and then post-secondary. As Mike said, 
if your child doesn't attend K through 12, you're in trouble as the parent. And if your child doesn't attend college, everyone knows that that's, there's no requirement. So I think legally, there's a clear difference. And policy-wise, you know, the things that are happening in these voucher schools that we have no clue what's going on, very, very different than the colleges and universities that are receiving state money. So. And it will be covered in their moot court, well, I'm sure, before the <laughs> before Judge Newby asks that question. <laughs> Uh, wait, I, I, Jason was in the back. Two very brief comments that I hope y'all can respond to. Um, first, I applaud all the hard work that has gone into this case so far. And I want to pick up on something you said, Dr. Ward, about not ending it here, but take that maybe in a different direction. Um, I think too often we get caught up in this dichotomy of public schools are broken. No, they're not. Public schools are broken. No, they're not. And, and that's sort of a false dichotomy in that there's, there's a third thing happening, which is that our, our public schools are so under-resourced that they can't do what they're supposed to do. Um, and that kind of gets left out of the conversation a lot, which I think then sort of um, either marginalizes or, or discounts the experiences of families that do have problems in the public schools, achievement gaps, school to prison pipeline, whatever. And so it's a missed opportunity to bring them into the fold. And I say that as a next step. Um, when do we start moving towards affirmative litigation to strengthen our public schools instead of being on the defensive all the time. The lack of instructional resources, teacher funding, um, sort of how can that be a next step to, to take us somewhere else so that maybe the right or the profiteers can stop um, um, sort of exploiting low wealth communities into thinking that this privatization is good and instead support some of the pleas that they're making. It's a good statement, Jason. Uh, do, do you need anything? Or you may have to shout. If you hold it, don't wiggle it. <laughs> hold it steady. Um, one of the things I want to make sure that I'm clear about is that I'm not an apologist for schools that aren't getting the job done for kids for kids who are vulnerable and who are struggling. Um, I believe we absolutely have an obligation to make sure that schools work well for all kids, uh, and we have to be accountable for that. Fact is that there are models uh, that help schools make that turnaround, but they're not cheap and they're not easy. Um, and you can't afford them if you under if you under resource schools. Um, so uh, I, I, I think I may be overly simplistic in my thinking about this, but I think Le Leandro already gives us the underpinnings um, uh, in terms of litigation and, and court decision to make the case that schools have to be adequately resourced so that that requirement of a sound basic education for all kids is an opportunity that's available for all kids. Um, and where that opportunity doesn't exist, the resources flow and the accountability mechanisms are in place to make sure that those schools turn around um, and provide the, the opportunity the kids deserve. That sentiment is exactly why I made a point of mentioning the, the new grading scale and to mention the fact that when you look at the schools that were designated D's or F's, you should also be looking at those legislators and giving them D's and F's because it's their constitutional responsibility. And it, it's not by mistake that these schools end up with these grades. They are underfunded. When you remove thousands of TAs from the public school system, when you eliminate the budget for textbooks with the rationale that you're going to move to digital technology and you you cut that budget by fifty dollars per student how many iPads and computers can you buy fifty dollars so they minimized the textbook budget, but they didn't increase the technology budget accordingly so these things aren't happening to our public schools by accident they're not failing by accident when you remove the teachers from the classroom because they can no longer afford to be there, when you remove the TAs, when you do things that you know will devastate the public school system, like an active voucher program that diverts $10 million, these things are an expectation, and these things have names, and they're the people on Jones Street. I think it's worth pointing out that whenever I debate on conservative talk radio on Friday afternoons when I go on the Bill LeMay show, 
the folks that I'm debating with often refer to our public schools as government schools. Yes. And as, you know, th th there's, there's definitely an intentional privatization movement of which some of this is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that takes place. Make the public schools fail and then use that as an excuse to further shift resources. Barlow, I think, was next, and then maybe David. Barlow. Uh, I'm Barlow Herger. I've got three uh, questions, two of which can be answered very quickly. I'd like to know how many of those students that were, were grandfathered in this year, how many uh, are enrolled under the, the voucher program right now? Uh, how many uh, children, we know how many children in charter schools, uh, publicly funded charter schools, are on free lunch? And finally, uh, Mike, and you might address this one, what is the record in those states that have had voucher programs for a long enough time we could see what their impact has been on public school? So I can answer the um, numbers question. So um, now that there's litigation involved, so when we want public information, we have to go through the other side's attorney because we're involved in the case. So the most updated data, uh, Lindsay has a public record requested now that they haven't responded to yet, but so we have September 29th data. And as of September 29th, 568 kids were receiving vouchers for a total of $1.145 million. And um, it, in your, you asked what percentage of those kids were in religious schools? No. It, no. It's a little bit broader than that. We all know those kids are on free lunch. That's how they got into the program. Right. Do we have any data on charter schools, publicly funded, how many of them have uh, free lunch uh, kids in them? Uh, we don't know because charter schools aren't required to provide free or reduced lunch. So there's, they don't have to keep track of that because they don't have to provide lunch. So we don't have any records of that. You'd have to go back and try to figure out whether they were getting free and reduced lunch before they left to go to the charter schools. Well, I'm old enough and I'm a southerner and I understand what you were talking about. I remember when they set up these private Christian academies um, to avoid segregation. And I bring that bias to the current movement. And I think, and I poke Lindsay over here on occasion to see if she can find out. I suspect that this is another reason the voucher program is to resegregate the school. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Yeah. we need the data. Helen Ladd at Duke and her colleagues have written extensively. I beg your pardon? Helen Ladd and other people have looked at that. That is a topic that has been written about, but it's one that we will be reporting more on. So it's, a, it's an excellent question, and it's one I think a lot of us have a feeling in our gut about what's yeah. going on. And, and so the other part that we've asked for most recently from the state is you know, the updated voucher numbers and the race of the kids who are going there. But again, we, there's no way we could know the race of the private schools unless they voluntarily give us the racial breakdown of their students because we can't. That's private information. But you know, the original uh, voucher law required the schools to have the same racial breakdown as the community. And that lasted about a year. The charter law. Charter, charter, school. charter schools. And I noticed that in the recent uh, report card, Raleigh Charter, which got an A and is one of the biggest or best of charter schools in the state, uh, I think their free lunch kids. Um, are, and we don't know what the race is, but it's less than 5%. And actually, Christine, there is a little public, some char uh, private schools do provide some information about their demographics, and so in the NAA, in North Carolina NAACP amicus brief, which the Center for Civil Rights helped draft, um, for example, you know, Word of God Christian Academy in Raleigh, which received 26 vouchers, is 100% African American compared to Wake County Schools, which is 49% white, 25% black, and 15% Latino. And we know that Tabernacle Christian School in Monroe, in Union County, is got 17 vouchers and is over 90% white, whereas the public schools in Monroe are 68% white and about 32% non-white. So what we know is at least um, in the five highest five private schools that received the most vouchers in that first round, we know 
that the 121 students attending those five private schools, which are either hypersegregated white or hypersegregated black, that students attending those private schools are moving from more racially diverse settings in their public schools to more racially segregated settings in these private schools. Thank you. David, did you have a question? Yeah, um, a couple of quick points and then a question. Um, it, it seems to me, just picking up what several of you have said, two, I think two important political talking points. One is quite obvious. It's, I'd like someone to, and I'm, I'm, I'm using this rhetorically, we need to say to our opponents, Explain to me how, if a school is struggling to need, meet the needs of high need students, how pulling more money out of that school makes it possible for them to do that. And that's sort of picking what you said, Jessica. And the other is a, a more political argument. Has anyone else struck by the fact that these very same legislators that seem to be crying all these crocodile tears over poor children and access to education are the same ones that are denying access to Medicaid and cutting the earned income tax credit and cutting unemployment compensation. I mean, I think we really have to hammer them on this. This is clearly, they are zeroing on education and making a very cynical, sort of privatized argument. This is not concern for poor children or, or the problem of poverty in this state. And we need to, I, you know, I, I call on all political leaders, you just gotta nail them on this. It is so patently obvious and they're not being called on it. And the final thing, I'm, I'm a history professor, so I guess my question is mainly on the litigators. Are you doing at all what, for example, the team did on Brown v. Board so many years ago? Do we have any historical record on the writing of that section of the Constitution? I mean, I'm assuming the men who wrote it, I'm assuming it was men, um, didn't say money in an account for the public schools goes to the public schools. That's absurd. Of course that's what's going to happen. I'm assuming they meant what your argument says, but do we have any historical records of the original intent? Since I'm sure the whole opposite side is all into original intent and all that stuff anyways. Right. So our brief, and again, if anyone wants to email me or, or call me, I'm happy to send you our brief. Say, it, your, it, say your email. Sure, my email is christine, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, at ncjustice.org. So our brief, I believe, we cite as our, our source um, a, a law review article or um, some source like that, that that looked back at what was going on at the time um, to, to get the intent. Um, I can, again, if you email me, I'll send you the, sure. the brief, but uh, they, I'll also send you their brief too, and they, you know, kind of their I, I, argument that by leaving out certain words and including certain words, that they end up with, that their argument they think is a winner. So. But I, I agree with you, to, to repeat, money for public education must go to public education. It, it's, we have to assume our drafters were better than that. Right. Right. We're running short on time on Gaza. Did you have a question? I think then we'll go. Yeah, my name's on Gaza Laughing House. I'm one of the leaders of the North Carolina Public Service Workers Union, UE Local 150. And as you probably guessed, our union is very concerned about this issue. Um, our union is mostly working class people, it's mostly people of color and very concerned about this issue. But also want to just thank you for the legal initiative, but want to also ask whether or not there's any class, you know, impact on, you know, race, sex, gender, in terms of these charter schools that are giving money to charter schools. And is that one aspect of the, or is that one of the aspects of this legal challenge that's being raised? What is, you know, the class impact on sex, gender, you know, race, religion? Because I know the public schools I went to you know, they were pretty well balanced, you know, it was very fortunate. Uh, I learned to, you know, I had Jewish kids in my school. I had <laughs> Catholic kids. I had kids who just came over from Cuba since I'm pretty old. It was during the time when the, many of the Cubans were coming to America because of the revolution going on in Cuba. But that was a part of my education, you know, going to the Vaz Mitzvah and meeting Jewish kids and Catholic kids and folks who were different than uh, who had different backgrounds, but wondering if there's any legal aspect or any legal uh, 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 you know, sort of challenge to the impact that these charter schools are putting money in charter schools in terms of how that takes away from the broader you know, sort of education young people have. And the second point I want to raise is the question of, you were saying um, that um, they, they talk about government schools. One of the things we learned from the Ocean Hill Brownville case in New York City was a question of community control. It raised the question of the relationship of the community to the schools. What sort of input do they have in terms of the education of children? I think that's very important in terms of trying to uh, deal with the uh, 
political, uh, of us being on the political defense sometimes. When the community is engaged, then, then it's, it's like the citizens being engaged. And um, too often our communities don't have that kind of uh, relationship with the schools in terms of uh, trying to give it some direction, policy direction, making sure that children get the quality of education that they truly need. The, there's some valuable lessons here in, the, in, the, in, the, in some of these uh, struggles that we've had over the years, over the last 20, 30 years, maybe 40 years, I guess. Uh, I'm pretty old. I guess that's the 1960s and 70s. But um, I mean, I think we need to take a closer look as we make these legal challenges of what other ways and means we could, you know, sort of make our, our case a lot, lot stronger. But I uh, want to let you know that there are many unions that support this particular initiative. Uh, we should even ask them to uh, sign off and donate some money in terms of amicus briefs, briefs and uh, really, really got to figure out how to engage more folks in this particular campaign. It's not just a legal, it's not just a legal fight. It's not like just a legal fight. Amen to that. Any response from anybody on the panel other than amen? <laughs> Well, the, the only thought is, so on the, the vouchers, um, originally we had a claim that you can't, dis that the voucher schools could discriminate based on race or national origin as well. So that's one thing that many of you know, last summer the re legislature went back and explicitly fixed and they said, no, they can't discriminate based on race or national origin. But they can discriminate on religion, they can discriminate on sex, they can discriminate on sexual orientation, income, um, hair color, I mean, anything. So so there's a, I mean, potentially a lot, and, and a lot of the schools, like I said, are very clear about, unless you sign a statement that says, you are 100% a believer in our faith, we will not take you. And, and we're allowed to do that under the current, but, you know, restrictions of the program, lack of restrictions. Yes, yeah. I know we could go. And it's important to note that over 70% of the non-public schools in North Carolina are secular schools. They're, they're, they're faith-based schools, right? Right, and over 90% of voucher students are going to religious schools. And it's important to note that the school that had the most applicants statewide was the Greensboro Islamic Academy. And that school in particular makes you attest to their faith in order to attend that school. I think we could probably carry on this discussion um, here the rest of the afternoon. Um, however, um, what we'd really like you to do is to carry it on with your friends and colleagues and family members out there in the community. So thank you all for coming. Stay tuned. If you can come next Tuesday to the Supreme Court, we'd love it. And uh, stay tuned for our reporting on this issue, and we'll see you online. Thanks for being here today. See you next time.